The Old Curiosity Shop, Chapter Sixty Five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. The Old Curiosity Shop by Charles Dickens, Chapter Sixty Five. It was well for the small servant that she was of a sharp, quick nature or the consequence of sending her out alone from the very neighbourhood in which it was most dangerous for her to appear, would probably have been the restoration of Miss Sally Brass to the supreme authority over her person. Not unmindful of the risk she ran, however, the Marchioness no sooner left the house than she dived into the first dark byway that presented itself, and without any present reference to the point to which her journey tended, made it her first business to put two good miles of brick and mortar between herself and Beavis Marks. When she had accomplished this object, she began to shape her course for the notary's office, to which, shrewdly inquiring of apple-women and oyster-sellers at street-corners, rather than in lighted shops or of well-dressed people at the hazard of attracting notice, she easily produced a direction. As carrier pigeons, on being first let loose at a strange place, beat the air at random for a short time before darting off towards the spot for which they are designed, so did the marchioness flutter round and round until she believed herself in safety, and then bear swiftly down upon the port for which she was bound. She had no bonnet, nothing on her head but a great cap which, in some old time, had been worn by Sally Brass, whose taste in head-dresses was, as we have seen, peculiar, and her speed was rather retarded than assisted by her shoes, which, being extremely large and slipshod, flew off every now and then and were difficult to find again among the crowd of passengers. Indeed, the poor little creature experienced so much trouble and delay from having to grope for these articles of dress in mud and kennel, and suffered in these researches so much jostling, pushing, squeezing, and bandying from hand to hand, that by the time she reached the street in which the notary lived, she was fairly worn out and exhausted, and could not refrain from tears. But to have got there at last was a great comfort, especially as there were lights still burning in the office window, and therefore some hope that she was not too late. So the marchioness dried her eyes with the back of her hands, and, stealing softly up the steps, peeped in through the glass door. Mr. Chuckster was standing behind the lid of his desk, making such preparations towards finishing off for the night, as pulling down his wristbands and pulling up his shirt-collar, settling his neck more gracefully in his stock, and secretly arranging his whiskers by the aid of a little triangular bit of looking-glass. Before the ashes of the fire stood two gentlemen, one of whom she rightly judged to be the notary, and the other, who was buttoning his great-coat and was evidently about to depart immediately, Mr. Abel Garland. Having made these observations, the small spy took counsel with herself, and resolved to wait in the street until Mr. Abel came out, as there would be then no fear of having to speak before Mr. Chuckster, and less difficulty in delivering her message. With this purpose she slipped out again, and, crossing the road, sat down upon a doorstep just opposite. She had hardly taken this position when there came dancing up the streets with his legs all wrong and his head everywhere by turns a pony. This pony had a little phaeton behind him and a man in it, but neither man nor phaeton seemed to embarrass him in the least as he reared up his hind legs or stopped or went on or stood still again or backed or went sideways without the smallest reference to them, just as the fancy seized him, and as if he were the freest animal in creation. When they came to the notary's door, the man called out in a very respectful manner, "'Woe, then!' intimating that if he might venture to express a wish, it would be that they stopped there. The pony made a moment's pause, but, as if it occurred to him that to stop when he was required might be to establish an inconvenient and dangerous precedent, he immediately started off again, rattled at a fast trot to the street corner, wheeled round, came back, and then stopped of his own accord. "'Oh, you're a precious creature,' said the man, who didn't venture by the by to come out in his true colours until he was safe on the pavement. "'I wish I had the rewarding of you, I do.' "'What has he been doing?' said Mr. Abel, tying a shawl round his neck as he came down the steps. "'He's enough to fret a man's heart out,' replied the hostler. "'He's the most wicious rascal. Whoa, then, will you?' "'He'll never stand still if you call him names,' said Mr. Abel, getting in and taking the reins. He's a very good fellow if you know how to manage him. This is the first time he has been out this long while, for he has lost his old driver and wouldn't stir for anybody else till this morning. The lamps are right, are they? That's well. Be here to take him to-morrow, if you please. Good night.' 
and after one or two strange plunges, quite of his own invention, the pony yielded to Mr. Abel's mildness and trotted gently off. All this time Mr. Chuckster had been standing at the door, and the small servant had been afraid to approach. She had nothing for it now, therefore, but to run after the chaise, and to call to Mr. Abel to stop. Being out of breath when she came up with it, she was unable to make him hear. The case was desperate, for the pony was quickening his pace. The marchioness hung on behind for a few moments, and, feeling that she could go no farther, and must soon yield, clambered by a vigorous effort into the hinder seat, and in doing so lost one of the shoes for ever. Mr. Abel, being in a thoughtful frame of mind, and having quite enough to do to keep the pony going, went jogging on without looking round, little dreaming of the strange figure that was close behind him, until the marchioness, having in some degree recovered her breath, and the loss of her shoe, and the novelty of her position, uttered close into his ear the words, "'I say, sir!' He turned his head quickly enough then, and, stopping the pony, cried with some trepidation, "'God bless me, what is this?' "'Don't be frightened, sir,' replied the still panting messenger. "'Oh, I've run such a way after you. "'What do you want with me?' said Mr. Abel. "'How did you come here?' "'I got in behind,' replied the marchioness. "'Oh, please drive on, sir, don't stop, and go towards the city, will you? "'And, oh, do please make haste, because it's of consequence. "'There's somebody wants to see you there. "'He sent me to say would you come directly, "'and that he knowed all about Kit, and could save him yet and prove his innocence. "'What do you tell me, child?' "'The truth upon my word and honour I do, but please to drive on, quick, please. I've been such a time gone, he'll think I'm lost.' Mr. Abel involuntarily urged the pony forward. The pony, impelled by some secret sympathy, or some new caprice, burst into a great pace, and neither slackened it, nor indulged in any eccentric performances, until they arrived at the door of Mr. Swiveller's lodging, where, marvellous to relate, he consented to stop when Mr. Abel checked him. "'See, it's the room up there,' said the marchioness, pointing to one where there was a faint light. "'Come!' Mr. Abel, who was one of the simplest and most retiring creatures in existence, and naturally timid withal, hesitated, for he had heard of people being decoyed into strange places to be robbed and murdered, under circumstances very like the present, and for anything he knew to the contrary, by guides very like the marchioness. His regard for Kit, however, overcame every other consideration. So entrusting Whisker to the charge of a man who was lingering hard by in expectation of the job, he suffered his companion to take his hand and to lead him up the dark and narrow stairs. He was not a little surprised to find himself conducted into a dimly lighted sick chamber where a man was sleeping tranquilly in bed. "'Ain't it nice to see him lying there so quiet?' said his guide, in an earnest whisper. "'Oh, you'd say it was, if you'd only seen him two or three days ago.' Mr. Abel made no answer, and, to say the truth, kept a long way from the bed and very near the door. His guide, who appeared to understand his reluctance, trimmed the candle, and, taking it in her hand, approached the bed. As she did so, the sleeper started up, and he recognized in the wasted face the features of Richard Swiveller. "'Why, how is this?' said Mr. Abel kindly, as he hurried towards him. "'You have been ill?' "'Very,' replied Dick. "'Nearly dead. You might have chanced to hear of your Richard on his bier, but for the friend I sent to fetch you. Another shake of the hand, Marchioness, if you please. Sit down, sir.' Mr. Abel seemed rather astonished to hear of the quality of his guide, and took a chair by the bedside. "'I have sent for you, sir,' said Dick. "'But she told you on what account?' "'She did. I am quite bewildered by all this. I really don't know what to say or think,' replied Mr. Abel. "'You'll say that presently,' retorted Dick. "'Marchioness, take a seat on the bed, will you? Now tell this gentleman all that you have told me, and be particular. Don't you speak another word, sir.' The story was repeated. It was, in effect, exactly the same as before, without any deviation or omission. Richard Swiveller kept his eyes fixed on his visitor during its narration, and directly it was concluded, took the word again. "'You have heard it all, and you'll not forget it. I'm too giddy and too queer to suggest anything, but you and your friends will know what to do. After this long delay, every minute is an age. If ever you went home fast in your life, go home fast to-night. Don't stop to say one word to me, but go. She will be found here whenever she's wanted, and as to me, you're pretty sure to find me at home for a week or two. There are more reasons than one for that.' Marchioness, alight. If you lose another minute in looking at me, sir, I'll never forgive you. 
Mr. Abel needed no more remonstrance or persuasion. He was gone in an instant, and the marchioness, returning from lighting him downstairs, reported that the pony, without any preliminary objection whatever, had dashed away at full gallop. "'That's right,' said Dick, "'and hearty of him, and I honour him from this time. But get some supper and a mug of beer, for I am sure you must be tired. Do have a mug of beer. It will do me as much good to see you take it as if I might drink it myself.' Nothing but this assurance could have prevailed upon the small nurse to indulge in such a luxury. Having eaten and drunk to Mr. Swiveller's extreme contentment, given him his drink and put everything in neat order, she wrapped herself in an old coverlet and lay down upon the rug by the fire. Mr. Swiveller was by that time murmuring in his sleep, "'Strew, then, O oh, strew, a bed of rushes. Here we will stay till morning blushes. Good night, Marchioness.' End of chapter 65《The Old Curiosity Shop》Chapter 66 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. The Old Curiosity Shop by Charles Dickens Chapter 66 On awakening in the morning, Richard Swiveller became conscious, by slow degrees, of whispering voices in his room. Looking out between the curtains, he espied Mr. Garland, Mr. Abel, the notary, and the single gentleman gathered round the marchioness, and talking to her with great earnestness, but in very subdued tones, fearing no doubt to disturb him. He lost no time in letting them know that this precaution was unnecessary, and all four gentlemen directly approached the bedside. Old Mr. Garland was the first to stretch out his hand and inquire how he felt. Dick was about to answer that he felt much better, though still as weak as need be, when his little nurse, pushing the visitors aside and pressing up to his pillow as if in jealousy of their interference, set his breakfast before him and insisted on his taking it before he underwent the fatigue of speaking or of being spoken to. Mr. Swiveller, who was perfectly ravenous, and had all night amazingly distinct and consistent dreams of mutton-chops, double stout, and similar delicacies, felt even the weak tea and dry toast such irresistible temptations that he consented to eat and drink on one condition. "'And that is,' said Dick, returning the pressure of Mr. Garland's hand, "'that you answer me this question truly before I take a bit or drop. Is it too late?' "'For completing the work you began so well last night,' returned the old gentleman. "'No. Set your mind at rest on that point. It is not, I assure you.' Comforted by this intelligence, the patient applied himself to his food with a keen appetite, though evidently not with a greater zest in the eating than his nurse appeared to have in seeing him eat. The manner of this meal was this. Mr. Swiveller, holding the slice of toast or cup of tea in his left hand, and taking a bite or drink, as the case might be, constantly kept in his right one palm of the marchioness tight-locked, and to shake, or even to kiss, this imprisoned hand, he would stop every now and then, in the very act of swallowing, with perfect seriousness of intention, and the utmost gravity, as often as he put anything into his mouth, whether for eating or drinking, the face of the marchioness lighted up beyond all description, but whenever he gave her one or other of these tokens of recognition, his countenance became overshadowed and she began to sob. Now whether this was in her laughing joy or in her crying one, the marchioness could not help turning to the visitors with an appealing look which seemed to say, "'You see this fellow, can I help this?' and they, being thus made, as it were, parties to the scene, as regularly answered by another look, no, certainly not. This dumb show, taking place during the whole time of the invalid's breakfast, and the invalid himself, pale and emaciated, performing no small part in the same, it may be fairly questioned whether at any meal, where no word good or bad was spoken from beginning to end, so much was expressed by gestures in themselves so slight and unimportant. At length, and to say the truth before very long, Mr. Swiveller had dispatched as much toast and tea as in that stage of his recovery it was discreet to let him have. But the cares of the marchioness did not stop here, for disappearing for an instant and presently returning with a basin of fair water, she laved his face and hands, brushed his hair, and, in short, made him as spruce and smart as anybody under such circumstances could be made and all this in as brisk and business-like a manner as if he were a very little boy and she his grown-up nurse 
To these various attentions, Mr. Swiveller submitted in a kind of grateful astonishment beyond the reach of language. When they were at last brought to an end, and the Marchioness had withdrawn into a distant corner to take her own poor breakfast, cold enough by that time, he turned his face away for some few moments, and shook hands heartily with the air. "'Gentlemen,' said Dick, rousing himself from this pause and turning round again, "'if you'll excuse me, men who have been brought so low as I have been are easily fatigued. I am fresh again now, and fit for talking. We're short of chairs here, among other trifles. But if you'll do me the favour to sit upon the bed—' "'What can we do for you?' said Mr. Garland kindly. "'If you could make the Marchioness yonder a Marchioness in real sober earnest,' returned Dick, "'I'd thank you to get it done off-hand. But as you can't, and as the question is not what you will do for me, but what you will do for somebody else who has a better claim upon you, pray, sir, let me know what you intend doing.' "'It's chiefly on that account that we have come just now,' said the single gentleman for you will have another visitor presently. We feared you would be anxious unless you knew from ourselves what steps we intended to take, and therefore came to you before we stirred in the matter. Gentlemen, returned Dick, I thank you. Anybody in the helpless state that you see me in is naturally anxious. Don't let me interrupt you, sir. Then you see, my good fellow, said the single gentleman, that while we have no doubt whatever of the truth of this disclosure, which has so providently come to light—meaning hers, said Dick, pointing to the Marchioness, meaning hers, of course, while we have no doubt that, or that a proper use of it would procure the poor lad's immediate pardon and liberation, we have a great doubt whether it would by itself enable us to reach Quilp, the chief agent in this villainy. I should tell you that this doubt has been confirmed into something very nearly approaching certainty by the best opinions we have been enabled, in this short space of time, to take upon the subject. You'll agree with us that to give him even the most distant chance of escape, if we could help it, would be monstrous. You say with us, no doubt, if somebody must escape, let it be any one but he. Yes, returned Dick, certainly. That is, if somebody must, but upon my word I'm unwilling that anybody should since laws were made for every degree to curb vice in others as well as in me and so forth you know doesn't it strike you in that light the single gentleman smiled as if the light in which mr swiveller had put the question were not the clearest in the world and proceeded to explain that they contemplated proceeding by stratagem in the first instance and that their design was to endeavour to extort a confession from the gentle sarah when she finds how much we know and how we know it he said and that she is clearly compromised already, we are not without strong hopes that we may be enabled through her means to punish the other two effectually. If we could do that, she might go scot-free for aught I cared. Dick received this project in anything but a gracious manner, representing with as much warmth as he was then capable of showing, that they would find the old buck, meaning Sarah, more difficult to manage than Quilp himself that for any tampering, terrifying, or cajolery, she was a very uncompromising and unyielding subject, that she was of a kind of brass not easily melted or moulded into shape, in short, that they were no match for her and would be signally defeated. But it was in vain to urge them to adopt some other course. The single gentleman has been described as explaining their joint intentions, but it should have been written that they all spoke together that if any one of them by chance held his peace for a moment, he stood gasping and panting for an opportunity to strike in again, in a word, that they had reached that pitch of impatience and anxiety where men can neither be persuaded nor reasoned with, and that it would have been as easy to turn the most impetuous wind that ever blew as to prevail on them to reconsider their determination. So after telling Mr. Swiveller how they had not lost sight of Kit's mother and the children, how they had never once even lost sight of Kit himself, but had been unremitting in their endeavours to procure a mitigation of his sentence, how they had been perfectly distracted between the strong proofs of his guilt and their own fading hopes of his innocence, and how he, Richard Swiveller, might keep his mind at rest, for everything should be happily adjusted between that time and night after telling him all this and adding a great many kind and cordial expressions personal to himself which it is unnecessary to recite mr garland the notary and the single gentleman took their leaves at a very critical time or richard swiveller must assuredly have been driven into another fever whereof the results might have been fatal mr abel remained behind 
very often looking at his watch and at the room door, until Mr. Swiveller was roused from a short nap by the setting down on the landing-place outside, as from the shoulders of a porter, of some great load, which seemed to shake the house, and made the little physic bottles on the mantel-shelf ring again. Directly the sound reached his ears, Mr. Abel started up and hobbled to the door and opened it, and, behold, there stood a strong man with a mighty hamper, which, being hauled into the room and presently unpacked, disgorged such treasures as tea and coffee and wine, and rusks and oranges and grapes, and fowls ready trussed for boiling, and calves' foot jelly, and arrowroot, and sago, and other delicate restoratives, that the small servant, who had never thought it possible that such things could be except in shops, stood rooted to the spot in her one shoe, with her mouth and eyes watering in unison, and her power of speech quite gone but not so Mr. Abel, or the strong man who emptied the hamper, big as it was, in a twinkling, and not so the nice old lady who appeared so suddenly that she might have come out of the hamper too, it was quite large enough, and who, bustling about on tiptoe and without noise, now here, now there, now everywhere at once, began to fill out the jelly in teacups, and to make chicken broth in small saucepans, and to peel oranges for the sick man, and to cut them up in little pieces, and to ply the small servant with glasses of wine and choice bits of everything, until more substantial meat could be prepared for her refreshment. The whole of which appearances were so unexpected and bewildering, that Mr. Swiveller, when he had taken two oranges and a little jelly, and had seen the strong man walk off with the empty basket, plainly leaving all that abundance for his use and benefit, was fain to lie down and fall asleep again from sheer inability to entertain such wonders in his mind. Meanwhile the single gentleman, the notary, and Mr. Garland repaired to a certain coffee-house, and from that place indicted and sent a letter to Miss Sally Brass, requesting her, in terms mysterious and brief, to favour an unknown friend who wished to consult her with her company there as speedily as possible. The communication performed its errand so well that within ten minutes of the messenger's return and report of its delivery, Miss Brass herself was announced. "'Pray, ma'am,' said the single gentleman, whom she found alone in the room, "'take a chair.' Miss Brass sat herself down, in a very stiff and frigid state, and seemed, as indeed she was, not a little astonished to find that the lodger and her mysterious correspondent were one and the same person. "'You did not expect to see me,' said the single gentleman. "'I didn't think much about it,' returned the beauty. "'I supposed it was business of some kind or other. "'If it's about the apartments, of course you'll give my brother regular notice, you know, "'or money, that's very easily settled. "'You're a responsible party, and in such a case lawful money and lawful notice are pretty much the same.' "'I'm obliged to you for your good opinion,' retorted the single gentleman, "'and quite concur in these sentiments, but that is not the subject on which I wish to speak with you.' "'Oh,' said Sally, "'then just state the particulars, will you?' "'I suppose it's professional business.' "'Why, it is connected with the law, certainly.' "'Very well,' returned Miss Brass. "'My brother and I are just the same. I can take any instructions or give you any advice.' "'As there are other parties interested beside myself,' said the single gentleman, rising and opening the door of an inner room, "'we had better confer together. Miss Brass is here, gentlemen.' Mr. Garland and the notary walked in, looking very grave, and drawing up two chairs, one on each side of the single gentleman, formed a kind of fence round the gentle Sarah, and penned her into a corner. Her brother Samson, under such circumstances, would certainly have evinced some confusion or anxiety, but she, all composure, pulled out the tin box and calmly took a pinch of snuff. "'Miss Brass,' said the notary, taking the word at this crisis, we professional people understand each other, and when we choose can say what we have to say in very few words. You advertised a runaway servant the other day. Well, returned Miss Sally, with a sudden flush overspreading her features, what of that? She is found, ma'am, said the notary, pulling out his pocket-handkerchief with a flourish. She is found. Well, who found her? demanded Sarah hastily. We did, ma'am, we three only last night, or you would have heard from us before. And now I have heard from you, said Miss Brass, folding her arms as though she were about to deny something to the death. What have you got to say? Something you have got into your heads about her, of course. Prove it, will you? That's all. Prove it. You have found her, you say. I can tell you, if you don't know it, that you have found the most artful, lying, pilfering, devilish little minx that ever was born. Have you got her here? she added, looking sharply round. 
"'No, she is not here at present,' returned the notary. "'But she is quite safe.' "'Ah!' cried Sally, twitching a pinch of snuff out of her box as spitefully as if she were in the very act of wrenching off the small servant's nose. "'She shall be safe enough from this time, I warrant you.' "'I hope so,' replied the notary. "'Did it occur to you for the first time, when you found she had run away, that there were two keys to your kitchen door?' Miss Sally took another pinch, and, putting her head on one side, looked at her questioner with a curious kind of spasm about her mouth, but with a cunning aspect of immense expression. Two keys,' repeated the notary one of which gave her the opportunities of roaming through your house at nights, when you supposed her fast locked up, and of overhearing confidential consultations, among others, that particular conference to be described to-day before a justice, which you will have an opportunity of hearing her relate, that conference which you and Mr. Brass held together on the night before that most unfortunate and innocent young man was accused of robbery by a horrible device of which I will only say that it may be characterized by the epithets which you have applied to this wretched little witness, and by a few stronger ones besides. Sally took another pinch. Although her face was wonderfully composed, it was apparent that she was wholly taken by surprise, and that what she had expected to be taxed with in connection with her small servant was something very different from this. "'Come, come, Miss Brass,' said the notary. "'You have great command of feature. But you feel, I see, that by a chance which never entered your imagination, this base design is revealed, and two of its plotters must be brought to justice.' Now you know the pains and penalties you are liable to, and so I need not dilate upon them, but I have a proposal to make to you. You have the honour of being sister to one of the greatest scoundrels unhung, and, if I may venture to say so to a lady, you are in every respect quite worthy of him. But connected with you, too, is a third party, a villain of the name of Quilp the prime mover of the whole diabolical device, who I believe to be worse than either. For his sake, Miss Brass, do us the favour to reveal the whole history of this affair. Let me remind you that your doing so at our instance will place you in a safe and comfortable position. Your present one is not desirable, and cannot injure your brother, for against him and you we have quite sufficient evidence as you hear already. I will not say to you that we suggest this course in mercy, for to tell you the truth we do not entertain any regard for you, but it is a necessity to which we are reduced, and I recommend it to you as a matter of the very best policy. Time, said Mr. Witherden, pulling out his watch, in a business like this is exceedingly precious. Favour us with your decision as speedily as possible, ma'am with a smile upon her face, and looking at each of the three by turns, Miss Brass took two or three more pinches of snuff, and having by this time very little left, travelled round and round the box with her forefinger and thumb, scraping up another. Having disposed of this likewise, and put the box carefully in her pocket, she said, "'I am to accept or reject at once, am I?' "'Yes,' said Mr. Witherden. The charming creature was opening her lips to speak in reply, when the door was hastily opened too, and the head of Samson Brass was thrust into the room. "'Excuse me,' said the gentleman hastily, "'wait a bit.' So saying, and quite indifferent to the astonishment his presence occasioned, he crept in, shut the door, kissed his greasy glove as servilely as if it were the dust, and made a most abject bow. "'Sarah,' said Brass, "'hold your tongue, if you please, and let me speak.' "'Gentlemen, if I could express the pleasure it gives me to see three such men in a happy unity of feeling and concord of sentiment, I think you would hardly believe me. But though I am unfortunate, nay, gentlemen, criminal, if we are to use harsh expressions in a company like this, still I have my feelings like other men. I have heard of a poet who remarked that feelings were the common lot of all. If he could have been a pig, gentlemen, and have uttered that sentiment, he would still have been immortal.' "'If you're not an idiot,' said Miss Brass harshly, "'hold your peace. "'Sarah, my dear,' returned her brother, "'thank you. "'But I know what I am about, my love, "'and will take the liberty of expressing myself accordingly. 
"'Mr. Witherden, sir, your handkerchief is hanging out of your pocket. Would you allow me to—' As Mr. Brass advanced to remedy this accident, the notary shrunk from him with an air of disgust. Brass, who over and above his usual prepossessing qualities had a scratched face, a green shade over one eye, and a hat grievously crushed, stopped short and looked round with a pitiful smile. "'He shuns me,' said Samson. "'Even when I would, as I may say, help coals of fire upon his head. "'Well, ah, but I am a falling house, "'and the rats, if I may be allowed the expression in reference to a gentleman I respect and love beyond everything, fly from me. "'Gentlemen, regarding your conversation just now, I happen to see my sister on her way here, and wondering where she could be going to, and being, may I venture to say, naturally of a suspicious turn, followed her. Since then I have been listening.' "'If you're not mad,' interposed Miss Sally, "'stop there and say no more.' "'Sarah, my dear,' rejoined Brass, with an undiminished politeness, "'I thank you kindly, but will still proceed. "'Mr. Witherden, sir, as we have the honour to be members of the same profession, "'to say nothing of that other gentleman having been my lodger, "'and having partaken, as one may say, of the hospitality of my roof, "'I think you might have given me the refusal of this offer in the first instance. "'I do indeed.' "'Now, my dear sir,' cried Brass, seeing that the notary was about to interrupt him, "'suffer me to speak, I beg.' Mr. Witherden was silent, and Brass went on. "'If you will do me the favour, he said, holding up the green shade and revealing an eye most horribly discoloured, "'to look at this, you will naturally inquire in your own minds how did I get it. "'If you look from that to my face, you will wonder what could have been the cause of all these scratches.' and if from then to my hat how it came into the state in which you see it gentlemen said brass striking the hat fiercely with his clinched hand to all these questions i answer quilp the three gentlemen looked at each other but said nothing i say pursued brass glancing aside at his sister as though he were talking for her information and speaking with a snarling malignity in violent contrast to his usual smoothness that i answer to all these questions quilp quilp who deludes me into his infernal den and takes a delight on looking on and chuckling while i scorch and burn and bruise and maim myself quilp who never once no never once in all our communications together has treated me otherwise than as a dog quilp whom i have always hated with my whole heart but never so much as lately he gives me the cold shoulder on this very matter as if he had nothing to do with it instead of being the first to propose it i can't trust him in one of his howling raving blazing humours i believe he'd let it out if it were murder and never think of himself so long as he could terrify me now said brass picking up his hat again and replacing the shade over his eye and actually crouching down in the excess of his civility what does all this lead to what should you say it led me to gentlemen could you guess at all near the mark nobody spoke brass stood smirking for a little while as if he had propounded some choice conundrum and then said to be short with you then it leads me to this if the truth has come out as it plainly has in a manner that there's no standing up against and a very sublime and grand thing is truth, gentlemen, in its way, though like other sublime and grand things, such as thunderstorms and that, we're not always over and above glad to see it, I had better turn upon this man than let this man turn upon me. It's clear to me that I am done for. Therefore, if anybody is to split, I had better be the person and have the advantage of it. Sarah, my dear, comparatively speaking, you're safe. I relate these circumstances for my own profit. With that, Mr. Brass, in a great hurry, revealed the whole story, bearing as heavily as possible on his amiable employer, and making himself out to be rather a saint-like and holy character, though subject he acknowledged to human weaknesses. He concluded thus— now gentlemen i am not a man who does things by halves being in for a penny i am ready as the saying is to be in for a pound you must do with me as you please and take me where you please if you wish to have this in writing we'll reduce it into manuscript immediately you will be tender with me i am sure i am quite confident you will be tender with me you are men of honour and have feeling hearts i yielded from necessity to quilp for though necessity has no law, she has her lawyers. I yield to you from necessity too, from policy besides, and because of feelings that have been a pretty long time working within me. 
punish quilp gentlemen weigh heavily upon him grind him down tread him under foot he has done as much by me for many and many a day having now arrived at the conclusion of his discourse samson checked the current of his wrath kissed his glove again and smiled as only parasites and cowards can and this said miss brass raising her head with which she had hitherto sat resting on her hands and surveying him from head to foot with a bitter sneer this is my brother is it this is my brother that i have worked and toiled for and believed to have had something of the man in him sarah my dear returned samson rubbing his hands feebly you disturb our friends besides you're you're disappointed sarah and not knowing what you say expose yourself yes you pitiful dastard retorted the lovely damsel i understand you you feared that i should be beforehand with you but do you think that i would have been enticed to say a word i'd have scorned it if they had tried and tempted me for twenty years Heh <laughs> simpered brass who in his deep debasement really seemed to have changed sexes with his sister and to have made over to her any spark of manliness he might have possessed you think so sarah you think so perhaps but you would have acted quite different my good fellow you will not have forgotten that it was a maxim with foxy our reverend father gentlemen always suspect everybody that's the maxim to go through life with if you were not actually about to purchase your own safety when i showed myself i suspect you'd have done it by this time and therefore i've done it myself and spared you the trouble as well as the shame the shame gentlemen added brass allowing himself to be slightly overcome if there is any is mine it's better that a female should be spared it with a deference to the better opinion of mr brass and more particularly to the authority of his great ancestor it may be doubted with humility whether the elevating principle laid down by the latter gentleman and acted upon by his descendant is always a prudent one or attended in practice with the desired results this is beyond question a bold and presumptuous doubt inasmuch as many distinguished characters called men of the world long-headed customers knowing dogs shrewd fellows capital hands at business and the like have made and do daily make this axiom their polar star and compass still the doubt may be gently insinuated and in illustration it may be observed that if mr brass not being over suspicious had without prying and listening left his sister to manage the conference on their joint behalf or prying and listening had not been in such a mighty hurry to anticipate her which he would not have been but for his distrust and jealousy he would probably have found himself much better off in the end thus it will always happen that these men of the world who go through it in armour defend themselves from quite as much good as evil to say nothing of the inconvenience and absurdity of mounting guard with a microscope at all times and of wearing a coat of mail on the most innocent occasions the three gentlemen spoke together for a few moments at the end of their consultation which was very brief the notary pointed to the writing materials on the table and informed mr brass that if he wished to make any statement in writing he had the opportunity of doing so at the same time he felt bound to tell him that they would require his attendance presently before a justice of the peace and that in what he did or said he was guided entirely by his own discretion gentlemen said brass drawing off his glove and crawling in spirit upon the ground before them i will justify the tenderness with which i know i shall be treated and as without tenderness i should now that this discovery has been made stand in the worst position of the three you may depend upon that i will make a clean breast mr witherden sir a kind of faintness is upon my spirits if you would do me the favour to ring the bell and order up a glass of something warm and spicy i shall notwithstanding what has passed have a melancholy pleasure in drinking your good health i had hoped said brass looking round with a mournful smile to have seen you three gentlemen one day or another with your legs under the mahogany in my humble parlour in the marks but hopes are fleeting dear me mr brass found himself so exceedingly affected at this point that he could say or do nothing more until some refreshment arrived having partaken of it pretty freely for one in his agitated state he sat down to write the lovely sarah now with her arms folded and now with her hands clasped behind her paced the room with manly strides while her brother was thus employed and sometimes stopped to pull out her snuff-box and bite the lid she continued to pace up and down until she was quite tired and then fell asleep on a chair near the door 
it has been supposed with some reason that this slumber was a sham or faint as she contrived to slip away unobserved in the dusk of the afternoon whether this was an intentional and waking departure or a somnambulistic leave-taking and walking in her sleep may remain a subject of contention but on one point and indeed the main one all parties are agreed in whatever state she walked away she certainly did not walk back again mention having been made of the dusk of the afternoon it will be inferred that mr brass's task occupied some time in the completion it was not finished until evening but being done at last that worthy person and the three friends adjourned in a hackney-coach to the private office of a justice who giving mr brass a warm reception and detaining him in a secure place that he might ensure to himself the pleasure of seeing him on the morrow dismissed the others with a cheering assurance that a warrant could not fail to be granted next day for the apprehension of mr quilp and that a proper application and statement of all the circumstances to the secretary of state who was fortunately in town would no doubt procure Kit's free pardon and liberation without delay. And now, indeed, it seemed that Quilp's malignant career was drawing to a close, and that retribution, which often travels slowly, especially when heaviest, had tracked his footsteps with a sure and certain scent, and was gaining on him fast. Unmindful of her stealthy tread, her victim holds his course in fancied triumph. Still at his heel she comes, and once afoot is never turned aside their business ended the three gentlemen hastened back to the lodgings of mr swiveller whom they found progressing so favourably in his recovery as to have been able to sit up for half an hour and to have conversed with cheerfulness mrs garland had gone home some time since but mr abel was still sitting with him after telling him all they had done the two mr garlands and the single gentleman as if by some previous understanding took their leaves for the night leaving the invalid alone with the notary and the small servant as you are so much better said mr witherden sitting down at his bedside i may venture to communicate to you a piece of news which has come to me professionally the idea of any professional intelligence from a gentleman connected with legal matters appeared to afford richard anything but a pleasing anticipation perhaps he connected it in his own mind with one or two outstanding accounts in reference to which he had already received divers threatening letters his countenance fell as he replied certainly sir i hope it's not anything of a very disagreeable nature though if i thought so i should choose some better time for communicating it replied the notary let me tell you first that my friends who have been here to-day know nothing of it and that their kindness to you has been quite spontaneous and with no hope of return it may do a thoughtless careless man good to know that dick thanked him and said he hoped it would i have been making some inquiries about you said mr witherden little thinking that i should find you under such a circumstances as those which have brought us together you are the nephew of rebecca swiveller spinster deceased of chesselburn in dorsetshire deceased cried dick deceased if you had been another sort of nephew you would have come into possession so says the will and i see no reason to doubt it of five-and-twenty thousand pounds as it is you have fallen into an annuity of one hundred and fifty pounds a year but i think i may congratulate you even upon that sir said dick sobbing and laughing together you may for please god we'll make a scholar of the poor marchioness yet and she shall walk in silk attire and sinner have to spare or may i never rise from this bed again End of chapter sixty six The Old Curiosity Shop, Chapter Sixty Seven. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. The Old Curiosity Shop by Charles Dickens, Chapter Sixty Seven. Unconscious of the proceedings faithfully narrated in the last chapter, and little dreaming of the mine which had been sprung beneath him, for to the end that he should have no warning of the business afoot, the profoundest secrecy was observed in the whole transaction mr quilp remained shut up in his hermitage undisturbed by any suspicion and extremely well satisfied with the result of his machinations being engaged in the adjustment of some accounts an occupation to which the silence and solitude of his retreat were very favourable he had not strayed from his den for two whole days the third day of his devotion to this pursuit found him still hard at work and little disposed to stir abroad 
It was the day next after Mr. Brass's confession, and consequently that which threatened the restriction of Mr. Quilp's liberty, and the abrupt communication to him of some very unpleasant and unwelcome facts. Having no intuitive perception of the cloud which lowered upon his house, the dwarf was in his ordinary state of cheerfulness, and when he found he was becoming too much engrossed by business with a due regard to his health and spirits, he varied its monotonous routine with a little screeching or howling or some other innocent relaxation of that nature. He was attended as usual by Tom Scott, who sat crouching over the fire after the manner of a toad, and from time to time, when his master's back was turned, imitating his grimaces with a fearful exactness. The figurehead had not yet disappeared, but remained in its old place. The face, horribly seared by the frequent application of the red-hot poker, and further ornamented by the insertion in the tip of the nose of a tenpenny nail, yet smiled blandly in its less lacerated parts, and seemed like a sturdy martyr to provoke its tormentor to the commission of new outrages and insults. The day in the highest and brightest quarters of the town was damp, dark, cold, and gloomy. In that low and marshy spot the fog filled every nook and corner with a thick, dense cloud. Every object was obscure at one or two yards' distance. The warning lights and fires upon the river were powerless beneath this pall, and but for a raw and piercing chillness in the air, and now and then the cry of some bewildered boatman as he rested on his oars and tried to make out where he was, the river itself might have been miles away. The mist, though sluggish and slow to move, was of a keenly searching kind. No muffling up in furs and broadcloth kept it out. It seemed to penetrate into the very bones of the shrinking wayfarers, and to rack them with cold and pains. Everything was wet and clammy to the touch. The warm blaze alone defied it, and leaped and sparkled merrily. It was a day to be at home, crowding about the fire, telling stories of travellers who had lost their way in such weather on heaths and moors, and to love a warm hearth more than ever. The dwarf's humour, as we know, was to have a fireside to himself, and when he was disposed to be convivial to enjoy himself alone. By no means insensible to the comfort of being within doors, he ordered Tom Scott to pile the little stove with coals, and dismissing his work for that day, determined to be jovial. To this end he lighted up fresh candles and heaped more fuel on the fire, and having dined off a beefsteak, which he cooked himself in somewhat of a savage and cannibal-like manner, brewed a great bowl of hot punch, lighted his pipe, and sat down to spend the evening. At this moment a low knocking at the cabin door arrested his attention. When it had been twice or thrice repeated, he softly opened the little window, and thrusting his head out, demanded who was there. "'Only me, Quilp,' replied a woman's voice. "'Only you,' cried the dwarf, stretching his neck to obtain a better view of his visitor. "'And what brings you here, you jade? How dare you approach the ogre's castle, eh?' "'I have come with some news,' rejoined his spouse. "'Don't be angry with me.' "'Is it good news, pleasant news, news to make a man skip and snap his fingers?' said the dwarf. "'Is the dear old lady dead?' "'I don't know what news it is, or whether it's good or bad,' rejoined his wife. "'Then she's alive,' said Quilp. "'And there's nothing the matter with her. "'Go home again, you bird of evil note. "'Go home.' "'I have brought a letter,' cried the meek little woman. "'Toss it in at the window here, and go your way,' said Quilp, interrupting her, "'or I'll come out and scratch you.' "'No, but please, Quilp, do hear me speak,' urged his submissive wife in tears. "'Please do.' "'Speak, then,' growled the dwarf, with a malicious grin. "'Be quick and short about it.' "'It was left at our house this afternoon,' said Mrs. Quilp, trembling, "'by a boy who said he didn't know from whom it came, "'but that it was given to him to leave, "'and that he was told to say it must be brought on to you directly, "'for it was of the greatest consequence. "'But please,' she added, as her husband stretched out his hand for it, "'please let me in. "'You don't know how wet and cold I am, "'or how many times I have lost my way in coming here through this thick fog. "'Let me dry myself at the fire for five minutes. "'I'll go away directly you tell me to, Quilp. "'Upon my word I will.' Her amiable husband hesitated for a few moments, but bethinking himself that the letter might require some answer, of which she could be the bearer, closed the window, opened the door, and bade her enter. Mrs. Quilp obeyed right willingly, 
and kneeling down before the fire to warm her hands, delivered into his a little packet. "'I'm glad you're wet,' said Quilp, snatching it and squinting at her. "'I'm glad you're cold. I'm glad you lost your way. I'm glad your eyes are red with crying. It does my heart good to see your little nose so pinched and frosty.' "'Oh, Quilp,' sobbed his wife, "'how cruel it is of you!' "'Did she think I was dead?' said Quilp, wrinkling his face into a most extraordinary series of grimaces. "'Did she think she was going to have all the money and to marry somebody she liked? Ha, ha, ha! Did she?' These taunts elicited no reply from the poor little woman, who remained on her knees warming her hands and sobbing to Mr. Quilp's great delight. But just as he was contemplating her, and chuckling excessively, he happened to observe that Tom Scott was delighted too. Wherefore, that he might have no presumptuous partner in his glee, the dwarf instantly collared him, dragged him to the door, and after a short scuffle kicked him into the yard. In return for this mark of attention, Tom immediately walked upon his hands to the window, and, if the expression be allowable, looked in with his shoes, besides rattling his feet upon the glass like a banshee upside down. As a matter of course, Mr. Quilp lost no time in resorting to the infallible poker, with which, after some dodging and lying in ambush, he paid his young friend one or two such unequivocal compliments that he vanished precipitously, and left him in quiet possession of the field. "'So, that little job being disposed of,' said the dwarf coolly, "'I'll read my letter. Hm," he muttered, looking at the direction. "'I ought to know this writing. Beautiful Sally!' Opening it, he read in a fair, round, legal hand as follows. "'Sammy has been practised upon, and his broken confidence. It has all come out. You had better not be in the way, for strangers are going to call upon you. They have been very quiet as yet, because they mean to surprise you. Don't lose time. I didn't. I am not to be found anywhere. If I was you, I wouldn't either. S.B. Late of B.M.' To describe the changes that passed over Quilp's face, as he read this letter half a dozen times, would require some new language, such for power of expression as was never written, read, or spoken. For a long time he did not utter one word, but after a considerable interval during which Mrs. Quilp was almost paralyzed with the alarm his looks engendered, he contrived to gasp out, "'If I had him here!' "'If I only had him here—' "'Oh, Quilp,' said his wife, "'what's the matter? Who are you angry with?' "'I should drown him,' said the dwarf, not heeding her. "'Too easy at death, too short, too quick. But the river runs close at hand. Oh, if I had him here, just to take him to the brink, coaxingly and pleasantly, holding him by the buttonhole, joking with him, and with a sudden push, to send him splashing down— Drowning men come to the surface three times, they say. Ah, to see him those three times, and mock him as his face came bobbing up. Oh, what a rich treat that would be! Quilp, stammered his wife, venturing at the same time to touch him on the shoulder. What has gone wrong? She was so terrified by the relish with which he pictured this pleasure to himself, that she could scarcely make herself intelligible. Such a bloodless cur, said Quilp, rubbing his hands very slowly and pressing them tight together. I thought his cowardice and servility were the best guarantee for his keeping silence. Oh, Brass, Brass, my dear, good, affectionate, faithful, complimentary, charming friend, if I only had you here! His wife, who had retreated lest she should seem to listen to these mutterings, ventured to approach him again, and was about to speak, when he hurried to the door and called Tom Scott, who, remembering his late gentle admonition, deemed it prudent to appear immediately. "'There,' said the dwarf, pulling him in. "'Take her home. Don't come here to-morrow, for this place will be shut up. Come back no more till you hear from me or see me. Do you mind?' Tom nodded sulkily, and beckoned Mrs. Quilp to lead the way. "'As for you,' said the dwarf, addressing himself to her, "'ask no questions about me. Make no search for me. Say nothing concerning me. I shall not be dead, mistress, and that'll comfort you. He'll take care of you.' "'But, Quilp, what is the matter? Where are you going? Do say something more.' "'I'll say that,' said the dwarf, seizing her by the arm, "'and do that, too, which undone and unsaid will be best for you, unless you go directly.' "'Has anything happened?' cried his wife. "'Oh, do tell me that.' "'Yes,' snarled the dwarf. "'No, what matters which? I have told you what to do. 
Woe betide you if you fail to do it or disobey me by a hair's breadth. Will you go? I am going. I'll go directly, but, faltered his wife, answer me one question first. Has this letter any connection with my dear little Nell? I must ask you that. I must indeed, Quilp. You cannot think what days and nights of sorrow I have had through having once deceived that child. I don't know what harm I may have brought about, but, great or little, I did it for you, Quilp. My conscience misgave me when I did it. Do answer me this question, if you please. The exasperated dwarf returned no answer, but turned round and caught up his usual weapon with such vehemence that Tom Scott dragged his charge away by main force and as swiftly as he could. It was well he did so, for Quilp, who was nearly mad with rage, pursued them to the neighbouring lane, and might have prolonged the chase but for the dense mist which obscured them from his view and appeared to thicken every moment. "'It will be a good night for travelling anonymously,' he said, as he returned slowly, being pretty well breathed with his run. "'Stay! We may look better here. This is too hospitable and free.' By a great exertion of strength he closed the two old gates, which were deeply sunken in the mud, and barred them with a heavy beam. That done, he shook his matted hair from about his eyes and tried them, strong and fast. "'The fence between this wharf and the next is easily climbed,' said the dwarf, when he had taken these precautions. "'There's a back lane, too, from there. That shall be my way out. A man need know his road well to find it in this lovely place to-night. I need fear no unwelcome visitors while this lasts, I think. Almost reduced to the necessity of groping his way with his hands, it had grown so dark and the fog had so much increased, he returned to his lair, and after musing for some time over the fire, busied himself in preparations for a speedy departure. While he was collecting a few necessaries and cramming them into his pockets, he never once ceased communing with himself in a low voice, or unclenched his teeth, which he had ground together on finishing Miss Brass's note. "'Oh, Samson!' he muttered. "'Good worthy creature! If I could but hug you! If I could only fold you in my arms and squeeze your ribs, as I could squeeze them if I once had you tight, what a meeting there would be between us!' If we ever do cross each other again, Samson, we'll have a greeting not easily to be forgotten, trust me. This time, Samson, this moment when all had gone on so well, was so nicely chosen. It was so thoughtful of you, so penitent, so good. Oh, if we were face to face in this room again, my white-livered man of law, how well contented one of us would be! There he stopped, and, raising the bowl of punch to his lips, drank a long, deep draught, as if it were fair water and cooling to his parched mouth. Setting it down abruptly and resuming his preparations, he went on with his soliloquy. "'There's Sally,' he said, with flashing eyes. "'The woman has spirit, determination, purpose. Was she afraid or petrified? She could have stabbed him, poisoned him safely. She might have seen this coming on. Why does she give me notice when it's too late?' But he sat there, yonder there, over there, with his white face and red head and sickly smile. Why didn't I know what was passing in his heart? It should have stopped beating that night if I had been in his secret, or there are no drugs to lull a man to sleep or no fire to burn him. Another drop from the bowl, and cowering over the fire with a ferocious aspect, he muttered to himself again, "'And this, like every other trouble and anxiety I have had of late times, springs from that old dotard and his darling child two wretched feeble wanderers i'll be their evil genius yet and you sweet kit honest kit virtuous innocent kit look to yourself where i hate i bite i hate you my darling fellow with good cause and proud as you are to-night i'll have my turn what's that a knocking at the gate he had closed a loud and violent knocking then a pause as if those who knocked had stopped to listen then the noise again more clamorous and importunate than before so soon said the dwarf and so eager i'm afraid i shall disappoint you it's well i'm quite prepared sally i thank you as he spoke he extinguished the candle in his impetuous attempts to subdue the brightness of the fire he overset the stove which came tumbling forward and fell with a crash upon the burning embers it had shot forth in its descent, leaving the room in pitchy darkness. 
the noise at the gate still continuing, he felt his way to the door, and stepped into the open air. At that moment the knocking ceased. It was about eight o'clock, but the dead of the darkest night would have been as noonday in comparison with the thick cloud which then rested upon the earth, and shrouded everything from view. He darted forward for a few paces, as if in the mouth of some dim, yawning cavern, then, thinking he had gone wrong, changed the direction of his steps, and stood still, not knowing where to turn. "'If they would knock again,' said Quilp, trying to peer into the gloom by which he was surrounded, "'the sound might guide me. Come, batter the gate once more.' He stood listening intently, but the noise was not renewed. Nothing was to be heard in that deserted place, but at intervals the distant barkings of dogs. The sound was far away, now in one quarter, now answered in another. Nor was it any guide, for it often came from shipboard, as he knew. "'If I could find a wall or fence,' said the dwarf, stretching out his arms and walking slowly on, "'I should know which way to turn. A good black devil's night's this to have my dear friend here. If I had but that wish, it might, for anything I cared, never be day again.' As the word passed his lips, he staggered and fell and next moment was fighting with the cold, dark water. For all its bubbling up and rushing in his ears, he could hear the knocking at the gate again, could hear a shout that followed it, could recognize the voice. For all his struggling and plashing, he could understand that they had lost their way and had wandered back to the point from which they started, that they were all but looking on while he was drowned, that they were close at hand but could not make an effort to save him, that he himself had shut and barred them out. He answered the shout, with a yell, which seemed to make the hundred fires that danced before his eyes tremble and flicker, as if a gust of wind had stirred them. It was of no avail. The strong tide filled his throat, and bore him on upon its rapid current. Another mortal struggle, and he was up again, beating the water with his hands, and looking out with wild and glaring eyes that showed him some black object he was drifting close upon the hull of a ship he could touch its smooth and slippery surface with his hand one loud cry now but the resistless water bore him down before he could give it utterance and driving him under it carried away a corpse it toyed and sported with its ghastly freight now bruising it upon the slimy piles now hiding it in mud or long rank grass now dragging it heavily over rough stones and gravel now feigning to yield it to its own element and in the same action luring it away, until, tired of the ugly plaything, it flung it on a swamp, a dismal place where pirates had swung in chains through many a wintry night, and left it there to bleach. And there it lay alone. The sky was red with flame, and the water that bore it there had been tinged with a sudden light as it flowed along. The place the deserted carcass had left so recently, a living man, was now a blazing ruin. There was something of the glare upon its face. The hair, stirred by the damp breeze, played in a kind of mockery of death, such a mockery as the man himself would have delighted in when alive, about its head, and its dress fluttered idly in the night wind. End of chapter 67《The Old Curiosity Shop》Chapter 68. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. — The Old Curiosity Shop by Charles Dickens. Chapter 68. Lighted rooms, bright fires, cheerful faces, the music of glad voices, words of love and welcome, warm hearts, and tears of happiness. What a change is this! But it is to such delights that Kit is hastening. They are awaiting him, he knows. He fears he will die of joy before he gets among them. They have prepared him for this all day. He is not to be carried off to-morrow with the rest, they tell him first. By degrees they let him know that doubts have arisen, that inquiries are to be made, and perhaps he may be pardoned after all. At last the evening being come, they bring him to a room where some gentlemen are assembled foremost among them is his good old master who comes and takes him by the hand he hears that his innocence is established and that he is pardoned he cannot see the speaker 
but he turns towards the voice, and in trying to answer, falls down insensible. They recover him again and tell him he must be composed and bear this like a man. Somebody says he must think of his poor mother. It is because he does think of her so much that the happy news had overpowered him. They crowd about him and tell him that the truth has gone abroad, and that all the town and country ring with sympathy for his misfortunes. He has no ears for this. His thoughts as yet have no wider range than home. Does she know it? What did she say? Who told her? He can speak of nothing else. They make him drink a little wine and talk kindly to him for a while until he is more collected and can listen and thank them. He is free to go. Mr. Garland thinks if he feels better it is time they went away. The gentlemen cluster round him and shake hands with him. He feels very grateful to them for the interest they have in him and for the kind promises they make. But the power of speech is gone again, and he has much ado to keep his feet, even though leaning on his master's arm. As they come down through the dismal passages, some officers in the jail who are in waiting there congratulate him in their rough way on his release. The newsmonger is of the number, but his manner is not quite hearty. There is something of surliness in his compliments. He looks upon Kit as an intruder, as one who has obtained admission to that place on false pretenses, who has enjoyed a privilege without being duly qualified. He may be a very good sort of young man, he thinks, but he has no business there, and the sooner he is gone, the better. The last door shuts behind them. They have passed the outer wall and stand in the open air. In the street he has so often pictured to himself when hemmed in by the gloomy stones and which has been all in his dreams. It seems wider and more busy than it used to be. The night is bad, and yet how cheerful and gay in his eyes. One of the gentlemen in taking leave of him pressed some money into his hand. He has not counted it, but when they had gone a few paces beyond the box for poor prisoners, he hastily returns and drops it in. Mr. Garland has a coach waiting in a neighboring street and taking kit inside with him bids the man drive home at first they can only travel at a foot pace and then with torches going on before because of the heavy fog but as they get farther from the river and leave the closer portions of the town behind they are able to dispense with this precaution and to proceed at a brisker rate on the road hard galloping would be too slow for kit but when they are drawing near their journey's end he begs they may go more slowly and when the house appears in sight that they must stop only for a minute or two to give him time to breathe but there is no stopping then for the old gentleman speaks stoutly to him the horses mend their pace and they are already at the garden gate next minute they are at the door there is a noise of tongues and tread of feet inside it opens kit rushes in and finds his mother clinging round his neck and there, too, is the ever-faithful Barbara's mother, still holding the baby as if she had never put it down since that sad day when they little hoped to have such joy as this. There she is, heaven bless her, crying her eyes out, and sobbing as never woman sobbed before. And there is little Barbara, poor little Barbara, so much thinner and so much paler, and yet so very pretty, trembling like a leaf and supporting herself against the wall and there is mrs garland neater and nicer than ever fainting away stone dead with nobody to help her and there is mr abel violently blowing his nose and wanting to embrace everybody and there is the single gentleman hovering round them all and constant to nothing for an instant and there is that good dear thoughtful little jacob sitting all alone by himself on the bottom stair with his hands on his knees like an old man roaring fearfully without giving any trouble to anybody, and each and all of them are for the time clean out of their wits, and do jointly and severally commit all manner of follies. And even when the rest have in some measure come to themselves again and can find words and smiles, Barbara, that soft-hearted, gentle, foolish little Barbara, is suddenly missed and found to be in a swoon by herself in the back parlour, from which swoon she falls into hysterics, and from which hysterics into a swoon again, and is indeed so bad that despite a mortal quantity of vinegar and cold water, she is hardly a bit better at last than she was at first. Then Kit's mother comes in and says, will he come back and speak to her? And Kit says, yes. 
and goes, and he says in a kind voice, Barbara, and Barbara's mother tells her that it's only Kit, and Barbara says, with her eyes closed all the time, Oh, but is it him indeed? And Barbara's mother says, To be sure it is, my dear, there's nothing the matter now. And in further assurance that he's safe and sound, Kit speaks to her again, and then Barbara goes off into another fit of laughter, and then into another fit of crying, and then Barbara's mother and Kit's mother nod to each other and pretend to scold her, but only to bring her to herself the faster, bless you, and being experienced matrons and acute at perceiving the first dawning symptoms of recovery, they comfort Kit with the assurance that she'll do now, and so dismiss him to the place from whence he came. Well, in that place, which is the next room, there are decanters of wine and all sorts of thing set out as grand as if Kit and his friends were first-rate company, and there is little Jacob walking, as the popular phrase is, into a home-made plum-cake at a most surprising pace, and keeping his eye on the figs and oranges which are to follow, and making the best use of his time, you may believe. Kit no sooner comes in than that single gentleman, never was such a busy gentleman, charges all the glasses, bumpers, and drinks his health, and tells him he shall never want a friend while he lives, and so does Mr. Garland, and so does Mrs. Garland, and so does Mr. Abel. But even this honour and distinction is not all, for the single gentleman forthwith pulls out of his pocket a massive silver watch, going hard and right to half a second, and upon the back of this watch is engraved Kit's name, with flourishes all over, and in short it is Kit's watch, bought expressly for him and presented to him on the spot. You may rest assured that Mr. and Mrs. Garland can't help hinting about their present in store, and that Mr. Abel tells outright that he has his, and that Kit is the happiest of the happy. There is one friend he has not seen yet and as he cannot be conveniently introduced into the family circle by reason of his being an iron-shod quadruped kit takes the first opportunity of slipping away and hurrying to the stable the moment he lays his hands upon the latch the pony neighs the loudest pony's greeting before he has crossed the threshold the pony is capering about his loose box for he brooks not the indignity of a halter mad to give him welcome and when Kit goes up to caress and pat him, and Pony rubs his nose against his coat, and fondles him more lovingly than ever Pony fondled man. It is the crowning circumstance of his earnest heartfelt reception, and Kit fairly puts his arm round Whisker's neck and hugs him. But how comes Barbara to trip in there? And how smart she is again? She has been at her glass since she recovered. How comes Barbara in the stable of all places in the world? Why, since Kit has been away, the pony would take his food from nobody but her, and Barbara, you see, not dreaming that Christopher was there, and just looking in to see that everything was right, has come upon him unawares, blushing little Barbara. It may be that Kit has caressed the pony enough. It may be that there are even better things to caress than ponies. He leaves him for Barbara, at any rate, and hopes she is better. Yes, Barbara is a great deal better she is afraid and here barbara looks down and blushes more that he must have thought her very foolish not at all says kit barbara is glad of that and coughs him just the slightest cough possible not more than that what a discreet pony when he chooses he is as quiet now as if he were of marble he has a very knowing look but that he always has we have hardly had time to shake hands barbara says kit barbara gives him hers why she is trembling now foolish fluttering barbara arm's length the length of an arm is not much barbara's was not a long arm by any means and besides she didn't hold it out straight but bent a little kit was so near her when they shook hands that he could see a small tiny tear yet trembling on an eyelash it was natural that he should look at it unknown to barbara it was natural that Barbara should raise her eyes unconsciously and find him out. Was it natural that at that instant, without any previous impulse or design, Kit should kiss Barbara? He did it, whether or no. And Barbara said, for shame, but let him do it, too, twice. He might have done it thrice, but the pony kicked up his heels and shook his head, as if he were suddenly taken with convulsions of delight, and Barbara, being frightened, ran away 
not straight to where her mother and Kit's mother were, though, lest they should see how red her cheeks were, and should ask her why. Sly little Barbara! When the first transports of the whole party had subsided, and Kit and his mother and Barbara and her mother, with little Jacob and the baby to boot, had their suppers together, which there was no hurrying over, for they were going to stop there all night, Mr. Garland called Kit to him, and, taking him into a room where they could be alone, told him that he had something yet to say which would surprise him greatly. Kit looked so anxious and turned so pale on hearing this, that the old gentleman hastened to add he would be agreeably surprised, and asked him if he would be ready next morning for a journey. "'For a journey, sir?' said Kit. "'In company with me and my friend in the next room, can you guess its purpose?' Kit turned paler yet, and shook his head. "'Oh, yes, I think you do already,' said his master. "'Try.' Kit murmured something rather rambling and unintelligible, but he plainly pronounced the words, "'Miss Nell,' three or four times, shaking his head while he did so, as if he would add that there was no hope of that. But Mr. Garland, instead of saying, "'Try again,' as Kit had made sure he would, told him very seriously that he had guessed right. "'The place of their retreat is indeed discovered,' he said, "'at last, and that is our journey's end.' Kit faltered out such questions as, where was it, and how it had been found, and how long since, and was she well and happy? "'Happy she is, beyond all doubt,' said Mr. Garland, "'and well, I—I I trust she will be soon. She has been weak and ailing, as I learn, but she was better when I heard this morning, and they were full of hope. Set you down, and you shall hear the rest.' Scarcely venturing to draw his breath, Kit did as he was told. Mr. Garland then related to him how he had a brother, of whom he would remember to have heard him speak, and whose picture, taken when he was a young man, hung in the best room, and how this brother lived a long way off in a country place, with an old clergyman who had been his early friend, how, although they loved each other as brothers should, they had not met for many years, but had communicated by letter from time to time, always looking forward to some period when they would take each other by the hand once more, and still letting the present time steal on, as it was the habit for men to do, and suffering the future to melt into the past. How this brother, whose temper was very mild and quiet and retiring, such as Mr. Abel's, was greatly beloved by the simple people among whom he dwelt, and quite revered the bachelor, for so they called him, and had every one experienced his charity and benevolence. How even those slight circumstances had come to his knowledge very slowly and in a course of years, for the bachelor was one of those whose goodness shuns the light, and who have more pleasure in discovering and extolling the good deeds of others than in trumpeting their own, be they never so commendable. How for that reason he seldom told them of his village friends, but how for all that his mind had become so full of two among them, a child and an old man, to whom he had been very kind that in a letter received a few days before, he had dwelt upon them from first to last, and had told such a tale of their wandering and mutual love, that few could read it without being moved to tears. How he, the recipient of that letter, was directly led to the belief that these must be the very wanderers for whom so much search had been made, and whom heaven had directed to his brother's care. How he had written for such further information as would put the fact beyond all doubt, how it had that morning arrived, had confirmed his first impression into a certainty, and was the immediate cause of that journey being planned, which they were to take to-morrow. "'In the meantime,' said the old gentleman, rising, and laying his hand on Kit's shoulder, "'you have a great need of rest, for such a day as this would wear out the strongest man. Good night, and heaven send our journey may have a prosperous ending.'" End of chapter 68The Old Curiosity Shop, Chapter Sixty Nine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. The Old Curiosity Shop by Charles Dickens, Chapter Sixty Nine. Kit was no sluggard next morning, but springing from his bed some time before day, began to prepare for his welcome expedition. The hurry of spirits consequent upon the events of yesterday, and the unexpected intelligence that he heard at night, had troubled his sleep through the long dark hours, and summoned such uneasy dreams about his pillow that it was best to rise. But had it been the beginning of some great labour with the same end in view, 
had it been the commencement of a long journey to be performed on foot in that inclement season of the year to be pursued under very privation and difficulty and to be achieved only with great distress fatigue and suffering had it been the dawn of some painful experience certain to task his utmost powers of resolution and endurance and to need his utmost fortitude but only likely to end if happily achieved in good fortune and delight to nell kit's cheerful zeal would have been as highly roused kit's ardour and impatience would have been at least the same nor was he alone excited and eager before he had been up a quarter of an hour the whole host were astir and busy everybody hurried to do something towards facilitating the preparations the single gentleman it is true could do nothing himself but he overlooked everybody else and was more locomotive than anybody the work of packing and making ready went briskly on and by daybreak every preparation for the journey was completed then kit began to wish they had not been quite so nimble for the travelling carriage which had been hired for the occasion was not to arrive until nine o'clock and there was nothing but breakfast to fill up the intervening blank of one hour and a half yes there was though there was barbara barbara was busy to be sure but so much the better kit could help her and that would pass away the time better than any means that could be devised barbara had no objection to this arrangement and kit tracking out the idea which had come upon him so suddenly overnight began to think that surely barbara was fond of him and surely he was fond of barbara now barbara if the truth must be told and it must and ought to be barbara seemed of all the little household to take the least pleasure in the bustle of the occasion and when kit in the openness of his heart told her how glad and overjoyed it made him barbara became more downcast still and seemed to have even less pleasure in it than before you have not been home so long christopher said barbara and it is impossible to tell how carelessly she said it you have not been home so long that you need to be glad to go away again i should think but for such a purpose returned kit to bring back miss nell to see her again only think of that i am so pleased too to think that you will see her barbara at last barbara did not absolutely say that she felt no gratification on this point but she expressed the sentiment so plainly by one little toss of her head that kit was quite disconcerted and wondered in his simplicity why she was so cool about it you'll say she has the sweetest and most beautiful face you ever saw i know said kit rubbing his hands i'm sure you'll say that barbara tossed her head again what's the matter barbara said kit nothing cried barbara and barbara pouted not sulkily or in an ugly manner but just enough to make her look more cherry-lipped than ever there is no school in which a pupil gets on so fast as that in which kit became a scholar when he gave barbara the kiss he saw what barbara meant now he had his lesson by heart all at once she was the book there it was before him as plain as print barbara said kit you are not cross with me oh dear no why should barbara be cross and what right had she to be cross and what did it matter whether she was cross or not who minded her why i do said kit of course i do barbara didn't see why it was of course at all kit was sure she must would she think again certainly barbara would think again no she didn't see why it was of course she didn't understand what christopher meant and besides she was sure they wanted her upstairs by this time and she must go indeed no but barbara said kit detaining her gently let us part friends i was always thinking of you in my troubles i should have been a great deal more miserable than i was if it hadn't been for you goodness gracious how pretty barbara was when she coloured and when she trembled like a little shrinking bird i am telling you the truth barbara upon my word but not half so strong as i could wish said kit when i want you to be pleased to see miss nell it's only because i like you to be pleased with what pleases me that's all as to her barbara i think i could almost die to do her service but you would think so too if you knew her as i do i am sure you would barbara was touched and sorry to have appeared indifferent i have been used you see said kit to talk and think of her almost as if she was an angel when i look forward to meeting her again i think of her smiling as she used to do and being glad to see me and putting out her hand and saying it's my own old kit or some such words as those like what she used to say i think of seeing her happy and with friends about her and brought up as she deserves and as she ought to be when i think of myself it's as her old servant and one that loved her dearly as his kind good gentle mistress and who would have gone yes and still would go through any harm to serve her 
once I couldn't help being afraid that if she came back with friends about her she might forget, or be ashamed, of having known a humble lad like me, and so might speak coldly, which would have cut me, Barbara, deeper than I can tell. But when I came to think again I feel sure that I was doing her wrong in this, and so I went on, as I did at first, hoping to see her once more, just as she used to be. Hoping this, and remembering what she was, has made me feel as if I would always try to please her, and always be what I should like to seem to her if I was still her servant. If I'm the better for that, and I don't think I'm the worse, I am grateful to her for it, and love and honour her the more. That's the plain honest truth, dear Barbara, upon my word it is. Little Barbara was not of a wayward or capricious nature, and, being full of remorse, melted into tears. To what more conversation this might have led we need not stop to inquire, for the wheels of the carriage were heard at that moment, and being followed by a smart ring at the garden gate, caused the bustle in the house, which had laid dormant for a short time, to burst again into tenfold life and vigour. Simultaneously with the travelling equipage arrived Mr. Chuckster in a hackney-cab, with certain papers and supplies of money for the single gentleman, into whose hands he delivered them. This duty discharged, he subsided into the bosom of the family, and entertaining himself with a strolling of peripatetic breakfast, watched, with genteel indifference, the process of loading the carriage. "'Snobby's in this, I see, sir,' he said to Mr. Abel Garland. "'I thought he wasn't in the last trip because it was expected that his presence wouldn't be acceptable to the ancient buffalo.' "'To whom, sir?' demanded Mr. Abel. "'To the old gentleman,' returned Mr. Chuckster, slightly abashed. "'Our client prefers to take him now,' said Mr. Abel dryly. "'There is no longer any need for that precaution, as my father's relationship to a gentleman in whom the objects of the search have full confidence will be a sufficient guarantee for the friendly nature of their errand.' "'Ah!' thought Mr. Chuckster, looking out of window. "'Anybody but me. Snobby before me, of course. He didn't happen to take that particular five-pound out, but I have not the smallest doubt that he's always up to something of that sort. I always said it, long before this came out.' devilish pretty girl that upon my soul an amazing little creature barbara was the subject of mr chuckster's commendations and as she was lingering near the carriage all being now ready for its departure that gentleman was suddenly seized with a strong interest in the proceedings which impelled him to swagger down the garden and take up his position at a convenient ogling distance having had great experience of the sex and being perfectly acquainted with all those little artifices which find the readiest road to their hearts mr chuckster on taking his ground planted one hand on his hip and with the other adjusted his flowing hair this is a favourite attitude in the polite circles and accompanied with a graceful whistling has been known to do immense execution such however is the difference between town and country that nobody took the smallest notice of this insinuating figure the wretches being wholly engaged in bidding the travellers farewell, in kissing hands to each other, waving handkerchiefs and the like tame and vulgar practices. For now the single gentleman and Mr. Garland were in the carriage, and the post-boy was in the saddle, and Kit, well wrapped and muffled up, was in the rumble behind, and Mrs. Garland was there, and Mr. Abel was there, and Kit's mother was there, and little Jacob was there, and Barbara's mother was visible in remote perspective, nursing the ever-wakeful baby, and all were nodding, beckoning, curtsying, or crying out good-bye with all the energy they could express. In another minute the carriage was out of sight, and Mr. Chuckster remained alone on the spot where it had lately been, with a vision of Kit standing up in the rumble waving his hand to Barbara, and of Barbara in the full light and lustre of his eyes, his eyes, Chuckster's, Chuckster the successful, on whom ladies of quality had looked with favour from phaetons in the parks on Sundays, waving hers to Kit. How Mr. Chuckster, entranced by this monstrous fact, stood for some time rooted to the earth, protesting within himself that Kit was the prince of felonious characters, and very emperor or great mogul of snobs, and how he clearly traced this revolting circumstance back to the old villainy of the shilling, are matters foreign to our purpose, which is to track the rolling wheels and bear the travellers' company on their cold, bleak journey. It was a bitter day. A keen wind was blowing, and rushed against them fiercely, bleaching the hard ground, shaking the white frost from the trees and hedges, and whirling it away like dust, but little cared Kit for weather. 
there was a freedom and freshness in the wind as it came howling by which let it cut never so sharp was welcome as it swept on with its cloud of frost bearing down the dry twigs and boughs and withered leaves and carrying them away pell-mell it seemed as though some general sympathy had got abroad and everything was in a hurry like themselves the harder the gusts the bitter progress they appeared to make it was a good thing to go struggling and fighting forward vanquishing them one by one to watch them driving up gathering strength and fury as they came along to bend for a moment as they whistled past and then to look back and see them speed away their hoarse noise dying in the distance and the stout trees cowering down before them all day long it blew without cessation the night was clear and starlit but the wind had not fallen and the cold was piercing sometimes towards the end of a long stage kit could not help wishing it were a little warmer but when they stopped to change horses and he had had a good run and what with that and the bustle of paying the old postillion and rousing the new one and running to and fro again until the horses were put to he was so warm that the blood tingled and smarted in his fingers ends then he felt as if to have it one degree less cold would be to lose half the delight and glory of the journey and up he jumped again right cheerily singing to the merry music of the wheels as they rolled away and leaving the townspeople in their warm beds pursued their course along the lonely road meantime the two gentlemen inside who were little disposed to sleep beguiled the time with conversation as both were anxious and expectant it naturally turned upon the subject of their expedition on the manner in which it had been brought about and on the hopes and fears they entertained respecting it of the former they had many of the latter few none perhaps beyond that indefinable uneasiness which is inseparable from suddenly awakened hope and protracted expectation in one of the pauses of their discourse and when half the night had worn away the single gentleman who had gradually become more and more silent and thoughtful turned to his companion and said abruptly are you a good listener like most other men i suppose returned mr garland smiling i can be if i am interested and if not interested i should still try to appear so why do you ask i have a short narrative on my lips rejoined his friend and will try you with it it is very brief pausing for no reply he laid his hand on the old gentleman's sleeve and proceeded thus there were once two brothers who loved each other dearly there was a disparity in their ages some twelve years i am not sure but they may insensibly have loved each other the better for that reason wide as the interval between them was however they became rivals too soon the deepest and strongest affection of both their hearts settled upon one object the youngest there were reasons for his being sensitive and watchful was the first to find this out i will not tell you what misery he underwent what agony of soul he knew how great his mental struggle was he had been a sickly child his brother patient and considerate in the midst of his own high health and strength had many and many a day denied himself the sports he loved to sit beside his coach telling him old stories till his pale face lighted up with an unwonted glow to carry him in his arms to some green spot where he could tend the poor pensive boy as he looked upon the bright summer day and saw all nature healthy but himself to be in any way his fond and faithful nurse i may not dwell on all he did to make the poor weak creature love him or my tale would have no end but when the time of trial came the younger brother's heart was full of those old days heaven strengthened it to repay the sacrifices of inconsiderate youth by one of thoughtful manhood he left his brother to be happy the truth never passed his lips and he quitted the country hoping to die abroad the elder brother married her she was in heaven before long and left him with an infant daughter if you have seen the picture gallery of any one old family you will remember how the same face and figure often the fairest and slightest of them all come upon you in different generations and how you trace the same sweet girl through a long line of portraits never growing old or changing the good angel of the race abiding by them in all reverses redeeming all their sins in this daughter the mother lived again 
you may judge with what devotion he who lost that mother almost in the winning clung to this girl her breathing image she grew to womanhood and gave her heart to one who could not know its worth well her fond father could not see her pine and droop he might be more deserving than he thought him he surely might become so with a wife like her he joined their hands and they were married through all the misery that followed this union through all the cold neglect and undeserved reproach through all the poverty he brought upon her through all the struggles of their daily life too mean and pitiful to tell but dreadful to endure she toiled on in the deep devotion of her spirit and in her better nature as only women can her means and substance wasted her father nearly beggared by her husband's hand and the hourly witness for they lived now under one roof of her ill usage and unhappiness she never but for him bewailed her fate patient and upheld by strong affection to the last she died a widow of some three weeks date leaving to her father's care two orphans one a son of ten or twelve years old the other a girl such another infant child the same in helplessness in age in form in feature as she had been herself when her young mother died the elder brother grandfather to these two children was now a broken man crushed and borne down less by the weight of years than by the heavy hand of sorrow with the wreck of his possessions he began to trade in pictures first and then in curious ancient things he had entertained a fondness for such matters from a boy and the tastes he had cultivated were now to yield him an anxious and precarious subsistence the boy grew like his father in mind and person the girl so like her mother that when the old man had her on his knee and looked into her mild blue eyes he felt as if awakening from a wretched dream and his daughter were a little child again the wayward boy soon spurned the shelter of his roof and sought associates more congenial to his tastes the old man and the child dwelt alone together it was then when the love of two dead people who had been nearest and dearest to his heart was all transferred to this slight creature when her face constantly before him reminded him from hour to hour of the too early change he had seen in such another of all the sufferings he had watched and known and all his child had undergone when the young man's profligate and hardened course drained him of money as his father's had and even sometimes occasioned them temporary privation and distress it was then that there began to beset him and to be ever in his mind a gloomy dread of poverty and want he had no thought for himself in this his fear was for the child it was a spectre in his house and haunted him night and day the younger brother had been a traveller in many countries and had made his pilgrimage through life alone his voluntary banishment had been misconstrued and he had borne not without pain reproach and slight for doing that which had wrung his heart and cast a mournful shadow on his path apart from this communication between himself and the elder was difficult and uncertain and often failed still it was not so wholly broken off but that he learnt with long blanks and gaps between each interval of information all that i have told you now then dreams of their young happy life happy to him though laden with pain and early care visited his pillow yet oftener than before and every night a boy again he was at his brother's side with the utmost speed he could exert he settled his affairs converted into money all the goods he had and with honourable wealth enough for both with open heart and hand with limbs that trembled as they bore him on with emotions such as men can hardly bear and live arrived one evening at his brother's door the narrator whose voice had faltered lately stopped the rest said mr garland pressing his hand after a pause i know yes rejoined his friend we may spare ourselves the sequel you know the poor result of all my search even when by dint of such inquiries as the utmost vigilance and sagacity could set on foot we found they had been seen with two poor travelling showmen and in time discovered the men themselves and in time the actual place of their retreat even then we were too late pray god we are not too late again we cannot be said mr garland this time we must succeed i have believed and hoped so returned the other i try to believe and hope so still but a heavy weight has fallen on my spirits my good friend 
and the sadness that gathers over me will yield to neither hope nor reason. That does not surprise me, said Mr. Garland. It is a natural consequence of the events you have recalled, of this dreary time and place, and above all of this wild and dismal night. A dismal night indeed. Hark how the wind is howling. End of chapter 69「The Old Curiosity Shop, Chapter Seventy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. The Old Curiosity Shop by Charles Dickens, Chapter Seventy. Day broke and found them still upon their way. Since leaving home, they had halted here and there for necessary refreshment and had frequently been delayed, especially in the night time, by waiting for fresh horses they had made no other stoppings but the weather continued rough and the roads were often steep and heavy it would be night again before they reached their place of destination kit all bluff and hardened with the cold went on manfully and having enough to do to keep his blood circulating to picture himself the happy end of this adventurous journey and to look about him and be amazed at everything had little spare time for thinking of discomforts Though his impatience and that of his fellow travellers rapidly increased as the day waned, the hours did not stand still. The short daylight of winter soon faded away, and it was dark again when they had yet many miles to travel. As it grew dusk, the wind fell. Its distant moanings were more low and mournful, and as it came creeping up the road and rattling covertly among the dry brambles on either hand, it seemed like some great phantom for whom the way was narrow, whose garments rustled as it stalked along. By degrees it lulled and died away, and then it came on to snow. The flakes fell fast and thick, soon covering the ground some inches deep, and spreading abroad a solemn stillness. The rolling wheels were noiseless, and the sharp ring and clatter of the horses' hooves became a dull, muffled tramp. The life of their progress seemed to be slowly hushed, and something death-like to usurp its place. Shading his eyes from the falling snow which froze upon their lashes and obscured his sight, Kit often tried to catch the earliest glimpse of twinkling lights, denoting their approach to some not distant town. He could descry objects enough at such times, but none correctly. Now a tall church spire appeared in view, which presently became a tree, a barn, a shadow on the ground thrown on it by their own bright lamps. Now there were horsemen, foot-passengers, carriages going on before, or meeting them in narrow ways, which, when they were close upon them, turned to shadows also. A wall, a ruin, a sturdy gable end, would rise up in the road, and when they were plunging headlong at it would be the road itself. Strange turnings, too, bridges, and sheets of water, appeared to start up here and there, making their way doubtful and uncertain, and yet they were on the same bare road, and these things, like the others, as they were passed, turned into dim illusions. He descended slowly from his seat, for his limbs were numbed, when they arrived at a lone posting-house, and inquired how far they had to go to reach their journey's end. It was a late hour in such by-places, and the people were abed, but a voice answered from an upper window, ten miles. The ten minutes that ensued appeared an hour and by the end of that time a shivering figure led out the horses they required, and after another brief delay they were again in motion. It was a cross-country road, full after the first three or four miles of holes and cart-ruts, which being covered by the snow were so many pitfalls to the trembling horses, and obliged them to keep a foot-pace. As it was next to impossible for men much agitated as they were by this time to sit still and move so slowly, all three got out and plodded on behind the carriage. The distance seemed interminable, and the walk was most laborious. As each was thinking within himself that the driver must have lost his way, a church bell close at hand struck the hour of midnight, and the carriage stopped. It had moved softly enough, but when it ceased to crunch the snow, the silence was as startling as if some great noise had been replaced by perfect stillness. "'This is the place, gentlemen,' said the driver, dismounting from his horse and knocking at the door of a little inn. "'Hullo! Past twelve o'clock is the dead of night here.' The knocking was loud and long, but it failed to rouse the drowsy inmates. All continued dark and silent as before. They fell back a little and looked up at the windows, which were mere black patches in the whitened house front. No light appeared. 
The house might have been deserted or the sleepers dead for any air of life it had about it. They spoke together with a strange inconsistency in whispers, unwilling to disturb again the dreary echoes they had just now raised. "'Let us go on,' said the younger brother, "'and leave this good fellow to wake them, if he can. I cannot rest until I know that we are not too late. Let us go on, in the name of heaven.' They did so, leaving the postillion in order to such accommodation as the house afforded, and to renew his knocking. Kit accompanied them with a little bundle which he had hung in the carriage when they left home, and had not forgotten since, the bird in his old cage, just as she had left him. She would be glad to see her bird, he knew. The road wound gently downward. As they proceeded, they lost sight of the church whose clock they had heard, and of the small village clustering round it. The knocking, which was now renewed, in which that stillness they could plainly hear, troubled them. They wished the man would forbear or that they had told him not to break the silence until they returned. The old church tower, clad in a ghostly garb of pure cold white, again rose up before them, and a few moments brought them close beside it. A venerable building, grey even in the midst of the hoary landscape. An ancient sundial on the belfry wall was nearly hidden by the snowdrift, and scarcely to be known for what it was. Time itself seemed to have grown dull and old, as if no day were ever to displace the melancholy night. A wicked gate was close at hand, but there was more than one path across the churchyard to which it led, and uncertain which to take, they came to a stand again. The village street, if street that could be called, which was an irregular cluster of poor cottages of many heights and ages, some with their fronts, some with their backs, and some with gable ends towards the road, with here and there a signpost or a shed encroaching on the path, was close at hand. There was a faint light in a chamber window not far off, and Kit ran towards the host to ask their way. His first shout was answered by an old man within, who presently appeared at the casement, wrapping some garment round his throat as a protection from the cold, and demanded who was abroad at that unseasonable hour wanting him. "'Tis hard weather this,' he grumbled, "'and not a night to call me up in. My trade is not of that kind that I need to be roused from bed. The business on which folks want me will keep cold, especially at this season. "'What do you want?' "'I would not have roused you if I had known you were old and ill,' said Kit. "'Old,' repeated the other peevishly. "'How do you know I am old? Not so old as you think, friend, perhaps. As to being ill, you will find many young people in worse case than I am. More's the pity that it should be so. Not that I should be strong and hearty for my years, I mean, but that they should be weak and tender. I ask your pardon, though,' said the old man. If I spoke rather rough at first, my eyes are not good at night. That's neither age nor illness. They never were, and I didn't see you were a stranger. I am sorry to call you from your bed, said Kit, but those gentlemen you may see by the churchyard gate are strangers too, who have just arrived from a long journey and seek the parsonage house. You can direct us? I should be able to, answered the old man in a trembling voice, for come next summer I have been sexton here good fifty years. The right-hand path, friend, is the road. There is no ill news for our good gentleman, I hope. Kit thanked him and made him a hasty answer in the negative. He was turning back when his attention was caught by the voice of a child. Looking up, he saw a very little creature at a neighboring window. "'What is that?' cried the child earnestly. "'Has my dream come true? Pray speak to me, whoever that is. Awaken up.' "'Poor boy,' said the sexton, before Kit could answer. "'How goes it, darling?' "'Has my dream come true?' exclaimed the child again, in a voice so fervent that it might have thrilled to the heart of any listener. "'But no, that can never be. How could it be? Oh, how could it?' "'I guess his meaning,' said the sexton. "'To bed again, poor boy.' "'I,' cried the child, in a burst of despair. "'I knew it could never be. I felt too sure of that before I asked. But all to-night and last night, too, it was the same. I never fall asleep, but that cruel dream comes back.' "'Try to sleep again,' said the old man soothingly. "'It will go in time. "'No, no, I would rather that it stayed, cruel as it is. "'I would rather that it stayed,' rejoined the child. "'I am not afraid to have it in my sleep, but I am so sad, so very, very sad.' The old man blessed him. The child in tears replied, "'Good night,' and Kit was again alone. He hurried back, moved by what he had heard, though more by the child's manner than by anything he had said, as his meaning was hidden from him they took the path indicated by the sexton and soon arrived before the parsonage wall turning round to look about them when they had got thus far they saw among some ruined buildings at a distance one single solitary light 
it shone from what appeared to be an old oriel window and being surrounded by the deep shadows of overhanging walls sparkled like a star bright and glimmering as the stars above their heads lonely and motionless as they it seemed to claim some kindred with the eternal lamps of heaven and to burn in fellowship with them what light is that said the younger brother it is surely said mr garland in the ruin where they live i see no other ruin hereabouts they cannot returned the brother hastily be waking at this late hour kit interposed directly and begged that while they rang and waited at the gate they would let him make his way to where the light was shining and try to ascertain if any people were about obtaining the permission he desired he darted off with breathless eagerness and still carrying the bird-cage in his hand made straight towards the spot it was not easy to hold that pace among the graves and at another time he might have gone more slowly or round by the path unmindful of all obstacles however he pressed forward without slackening his speed and soon arrived within a few yards of the window he approached as softly as he could and advancing so near the wall as to brush the whitened ivy with his dress listened there was no sound inside the church itself was not more quiet touching the glass with his cheek he listened again no and yet there was such a silence all around that he felt sure he could have heard even the breathing of a sleeper if there had been one there a strange circumstance a light in such a place at that time of night with no one near it a curtain was drawn across the lower portion of the window and he could not see into the room but there was no shadow thrown upon it from within to have gained a footing on the wall and tried to look in from above would have been attended with some danger certainly with some noise and the chance of terrifying the child if that really were her habitation again and again he listened again and again the same wearisome blank leaving the spot with slow and cautious steps and skirting the ruin for a few paces he came at length to a door he knocked no answer but there was a curious noise inside it was difficult to determine what it was it bore a resemblance to the low moaning of one in pain but it was not that being far too regular and constant now it seemed a kind of song now a wail seemed that is to the changing fancy for the sound itself was never changed or checked it was unlike anything he had ever heard and in its tone there was something fearful chilling and unearthly the listener's blood ran colder now than ever it had done in frost and snow but he knocked again there was no answer and the sound went on without any interruption he laid his hand softly upon the latch and put his knee against the door it was secured on the inside but yielded to the pressure and turned upon its hinges he saw the glimmering of a fire upon the old walls and entered End of chapter seventy